Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 289, Socinian Approaches to John 1, Part 2. In this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, we'll hear a little bit more from that very interesting New Testament in an improved version, and we'll also hear the perspective of what are now some lesser-known Unitarian Christians, people who also take what you can broadly call a Socinian interpretation of John 1. We'll start with Unitarian educator, author, and minister, Lant Carpenter. This Englishman was the author of An Examination of the Charges Made Against Unitarians and Unitarianism. And earlier, he published An Introduction to the Geography of the New Testament. But right now, I want to read you a portion of his book, Unitarianism, the Doctrine of the Gospel, A View of the Scriptural Grounds of Unitarianism, 3rd edition from 1823. Like today's Unitarian Christians, he departs from Catholic Orthodoxy because, in his view, the New Testament compels him to. So before I tell you what he says about John 1, I'm going to read you some conclusions that he makes about the other books of the New Testament. The section is entitled, Recapitulation of the Evidence of Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude. He starts this way because he wants to emphasize that John comes from the same milieu as these other books, and you would expect it to be in accordance with these other books and not to be pushing something radically new and different. Nowadays, some scholars are very happy to say that John has just radically developed the gospel message, you know, in the 90s or something, 90s AD, and then they would put, you know, Mark... Luke and Matthew in the 60s through the 80s AD, perhaps. Really? You know, in like 10 years, we just radically inflated the claims made for Jesus? Anyway, this is how Pastor Carpenter recapitulates the evidence from the other New Testament books. I have now briefly stated what I believe to be a just view of the evidence of all the writers of the New Testament, except the Apostle John, And I feel no hesitation in asserting that no one of them in any way teaches the proper deity of the Son of God, still less that he is the very and eternal God of one substance, power, and eternity with the Father, that the general tenor of their writings is entirely inconsistent with those positions, and that some passages are in direct opposition to them. With respect to the lower schemes which reject the simple or proper humanity of our Savior, I feel authorized by my examination to maintain that though a few passages occur which, if those schemes were previously proved to be scriptural, would countenance them, yet they admit of a just interpretation much more conformable to the general tenor of those writings, and most strongly supported by express assertions in other parts of them and that the evidence derived from those writings is therefore totally inadequate to prove doctrines which, to say the least, are not consistent with the plain and obvious sense of the words of those writers in various parts. And since it is inconceivable that they would leave a point so striking, and, as most will admit, so momentous as our Lord's superiority in nature, to be derived by inference merely from a small number of passages which correctly admit of a different construction, and in some cases require it if we consider their connection, I am justified in asserting that those apostles and evangelists do not teach such superiority of nature, and that therefore, from their evidence alone, there would be no sufficient reason to receive this doctrine as Christian doctrine. And farther, since in those writings there is nothing which, when interpreted by the connection and by other passages of the same writer, is in any way inconsistent with the belief that Jesus, the Son of God, was strictly and properly speaking a man who was appointed by God to execute a purpose of the utmost importance to the welfare of mankind, who was endowed by God with all necessary supplies of knowledge and power, and who was raised from the dead by God, 
and exalted by him to be the dispenser of all those extraordinary powers by which the blessed influences of the gospel were extensively diffused among the Gentiles as well as the Jews, or in other words, by which mankind were anew created in righteousness and true holiness, and to be the future judge of all men, And since these things, and nothing more than these respecting the nature or even the dignity of Jesus, are taught in those writings, I feel myself authorized to assert that, on their evidence, Unitarianism is the doctrine of the gospel. So to paraphrase that, that Christ has a divine nature is not taught in these books. It could be inferred through a contentious interpretation of a few passages in these books, but If you interpret those passages according to the rest of the book and the views of the the author's writings as a whole, you find that there are non-arbitrary, at least as plausible, indeed usually more plausible interpretations of those same passages, which don't require that Jesus has a divine nature. And what is the chance that these authors believe in the deity of Christ and they just leave this point to the reader to infer from just a small number of passages in their writings? It's vanishingly unlikely, right? So the fact that it's not a teaching point, that it's not clearly asserted, that seems to indicate that they don't believe in the deity of Christ, that he has a divine nature as well as a human nature. But they do seem to think he's a man. And so if you believe in natures, you'd have to have a human nature. Okay, so with these observations in hand, he now turns to John. And here you're going to hear his interpretation at length of John 1. He's going to explain his interpretation by way of giving an expansive translation and paraphrase of the passage in question. This section is called Evidence of John. Is it then probable that the writings of the Apostle John alone declare the essential truths of the gospel? I do not ask if they teach anything inconsistent with those of the other apostles, who had equally their commission from Jesus and were equally the partakers of the Holy Spirit. But do they teach, do they even imply anything additional to what we should learn from the others, separate from the evidence of John? I think not, and I proceed to show the grounds of my conviction. The Apostle John begins his gospel with an animated and highly interesting declaration of the divine authority of Jesus and of his agency in the gospel dispensation. No doubt can, I think, exist in the minds of any who attentively consider the first three chapters that the Apostle had in view to show the superiority of our Lord's office, at least, over that of John the Baptist. And all who admit that by the Logos the Apostle meant Jesus Christ must also admit that in the introduction he had in view to show his high dignity. How natural it then would have been if John knew of what he is now supposed to teach— the proper deity of our Lord and his eternal power and Godhead, for him to have begun, from all eternity the Logos existed, he is the very and eternal God, of one substance, power, and eternity with the Father, he created the heavens and the earth and all things that are in them, etc., and to have concluded his gospel by saying, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the divine Logos, himself very and eternal God, begotten from everlasting of the Father, etc. And if either of the lower schemes opposing Unitarianism, particularly the proper Arian scheme, had been the belief of the Apostle, it strikes me that he would have begun in language very different from what he actually employs, which I think evidently refers not to the nature of Jesus, but to his exalted character and agency as the Logos. The evangelist had seen the wonderful effects of faith in Jesus as the Son of God. He had also seen light break in through the midst of the gloomy darkness of heathen superstition and vice. He had seen numbers in those countries where he had resided, or which he had visited, brought into a state of great and glorious privilege, enabled to obtain holiness and happiness, to overcome the world, and to gain everlasting life. He who once was his friend and companion, who had honored him with the most endearing intimacy, whom he had seen expiring in agony on the cross, and perhaps assisted to deposit in the sepulcher, had been raised from the grave by the mighty power of God, had been exalted to the highest dignity, and made the dispenser of those powers by which the wondrous change in the state of mankind had been produced so rapidly and extensively. 
What more natural than that he should begin his memoirs of his exalted friend and master with words which show his just sense of the dignity of his character as receiving direct communications from the Most High, and being the agent in dispensing his richest blessings. Okay, so now he's going to give his translation combined with expansive paraphrase to explain his take on this passage, what he thinks the author means. And in a footnote, he says, R.K., beginning, occurs 23 times in St. John's writings and is applied 14 times to the commencement of our Lord's ministry, but it is not once used in them to denote the original creation. Here's his paraphrase. In the beginning of this new age, this grand era of the moral world, the apostle appears to me to say, he was the word, was appointed to be the revealer of the divine will. Let me pause here. This is an idiosyncratic translation. Um, he thinks the subject of that first clause was Jesus, and it's saying that Jesus was the word. Right in Greek, you just have NRK, ein halagos, in the beginning, was the word. So the Greek doesn't explicitly name Jesus as the subject, but if Jesus had already been introduced as the subject, then yeah, you might take it that way, that he, the unnamed subject, Jesus, in the beginning was the word. So he wants to take the word as the predicate and not as the subject. And the reason I think it's a bad translation is because, to me, it's clear that in each of these three assertions, the word is the subject, not the predicate. He's asserting three things about the word, that it was in the beginning, that it was with God, and that it, in some sense, was God. But let's press on. So, he wants to say, in the beginning he was the Word, and the Word was with God, favored by his Heavenly Father with unique fellowship with him, and with express and complete communications respecting that grace and truth which came by him, and the means by which his all-important commission was to be executed. And the Word was God, or rather, a God, since to him the word of God came, and he was the representative of the Most High. All right, so in the footnote, he cites John 10, 34 and 35, where Jesus said, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and he's referring to Old Testament figures, whether human or angelic, being called gods by scripture. Well, the word of God came to Jesus too, so then he could be referred to as a theos. The same was in the beginning with God, from the first instructed by him and receiving all his high powers and his inspired knowledge directly from him. All things relative to the Christian dispensation were done or executed through him. Aided by divine power and acting under divine authority, he accomplished the gracious purposes for which he came. In the footnote, he comments the Greek panta, all things, may and often must be taken, as I shall hereafter show, in a restricted sense. It never signifies the universe in John's writings, and that this apostle indisputably uses it to signify all things relative to the Christian dispensation, see especially 1 John 2.20, but you have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, and know all things, in Greek, panta. Right, not all things whatsoever, but his point is all things relative to the new deal, I guess. And without him was not anything done that was done. He gave the apostles their commission and illuminated their minds. He communicated to them the miraculous powers by which they were to diffuse and establish the gospel. He continually directed them in their great work. And it was through his agency that the world was anew created, and Gentiles as well as Jews placed in a state of spiritual privilege and made heirs of eternal salvation. In or by him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He had authority to reveal everlasting life, to enlighten thereby the darkness of nature, and extend the prospects of mankind to an eternal world. Yet men loved darkness rather than light, and too many rejected the offered blessings. The apostle then declares that John was a divine messenger sent to bear witness to him who was to give to men the light of life, but that he was not himself the light which was to enlighten mankind.
And he says in a footnote, it is probable from various expressions in the former part of John's gospel that some of the disciples of John the Baptist retained their attachment to their master and represented him and not Jesus Christ as the chief person. Ecclesiastical history, he's talking about Eusebius here, speaks of a sect holding such opinions called Sabians. Back to his paraphrase, but that he was not himself the light which was to enlighten mankind. And continues in verse 9, that was the true light which, having come into the world, or having come forth from God, is giving light to every man, to mankind in general, without regard to civil or religious distinctions. He was in the world, he dwelt among men while engaged in executing his important commission, and the world was made or formed anew through him, introduced by him into a new state, a state of blessed and sanctifying privilege. And yet the world knew him not. He was despised and rejected of men. He came unto his own people, the Jewish nation, particularly the people of the Messiah, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the privilege of becoming children of God. The objects of divine favor here and heirs of a blessed immortality, even to those who believe in his name, who have been born or introduced into this state of sanctifying privilege, not by blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, that is, whatever be the precise meaning of each clause, not by Jewish descent or proselytism, but by God, through his gracious disposals and in consequence of their godly disposition. Verse 14, And the Word, this illustrious revealer of the divine will, though highly exalted by the Father's love and favor, and appointed to high dignity and power, became, or was, flesh. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We might have expected that he would be raised above the common lot of humanity, but he was subject to infirmity, distress, and mortality, and exposed to want and suffering, and at last experienced the shame and agony of the cross. And for a short time he dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, with all the faithfulness and goodness of affectionate friendship. And we beheld his glory, the glorious displays of divine power by which his authority was confirmed, and the ennobling marks of divine approbation, glory as of an only son from his father. John too bore witness concerning him, and cried, saying, This is he of whom I said, He that comes after me has become before me, has taken precedency of me in dignity and power, for he was, indeed, my superior, my principal, the great object of my ministry, to prepare whose way I have been sent forth from God. And well he might, since of his fullness, of those abundant blessings which he came to communicate, have we all received, even grace for grace, that is, grace proportioned to the gracious gifts of the Father to him, or gracious privileges beyond the privileges of the former dispensation. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, or the true grace, came by Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, that is, no one has been favored by God with such clear disclosures of the secret purposes of his grace as he communicated through Christ, the only Son, who is in the heart of the Father, enjoying in his more immediate presence the tokens of his love and approbation, he has revealed him. Such is the idea which, in its leading features, I have long entertained of the meaning of this much misunderstood, yet not obscure passage, without laying any stress upon my own interpretation in its minuter parts, I feel more and more satisfied as to the general principles of it, and so far from considering the passage as inconsistent with Unitarianism, it appears to me to declare the proper humanity of the Logos, and to contain nothing which, when interpreted by the general tenor of the New Testament and other passages of the Apostles' writings, is inapplicable to one who was strictly and properly a man, but was entrusted with the most illustrious commission, favored with the most intimate communion with God for the purposes of his mission, and made the agent in the communication of the most important blessings. This passage declares no more of Jesus than what the Apostle assures us he wrote his gospel to prove, namely, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And I am satisfied that the rest of his writings teach us nothing further respecting the nature of our Savior. In fact, 
The Gospel of John, though it contains some expressions which, when interpreted by prevailing opinions, seem to intimate the pre-existence of our Lord, yet more than any other part of the New Testament affords proof that whatever powers Jesus possessed, he derived them from God, that he was inferior to and dependent upon him, that he was sent by God and made it his steady aim to do the will of God. You have to love his 19th century wordiness. But on the whole, it's a fairly well put together package, isn't it? Aside from that idiosyncratic translation in the first verse, I mean, this interpretation has a certain plausibility. Now, one thing he's presupposing that some of you will not grant is that the rest of the gospel doesn't teach that Jesus has a divine nature. I'm totally convinced that he's right about that. But that's an argument that needs to happen another time, because there are well-established traditions of just inferring that Jesus is God from a whole bunch of things, right? The I am statements, before Abraham was, I am. Thomas allegedly calling him my Lord and my God in chapter 20. Yes, these must all be dealt with. Of course, to my eye, this book also sharply distinguishes the Son of God from God in a bunch of ways. And this material tends to be ignored by people who are eager to show that John's teaching that Jesus is God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a voice from the 1690s. Pastor Stephen Nye was a very interesting character. I assume that he was born to at least nominally Trinitarian Christian parents in England. He really comes onto the scene in about 1689 when he starts writing these anonymous pamphlets arguing for Unitarian theology. In an earlier generation, John Biddle had studied the Socinians' writings and knew the New Testament very, very well and he began to proclaim a type of Unitarian Christian theology, though he had Jesus pre-existing and the Holy Spirit being a, a being, a self. In this time, the spirit of Reformation was still very much alive, and there were a number of Anglicans and other Protestants in this time saying, wait a second, do we really need the Athanasian Creed? Wait a second, do we really need these paradoxes? Or are we just foisting later and problematic ideas onto these sources, can't we understand these sources better without this Trinitarian machinery? To make a long story short, a certain Trinitarian named Sherlock published a book in which he claimed that he gave the true exposition of the doctrine of the Trinity. And in that book, he said that the persons of the Trinity were so many minds. And he was pounced upon by other Trinitarians who said, no, that's tritheism, that's not Trinitarianism. And Stephen Nye and others got into the mix arguing for a Unitarian perspective. Stephen Nye was a deadly polemicist. As we used to say when I lived in Rhode Island for five years, he was wicked smart. He merrily sliced and diced all of these competing Trinity theories and pointed out their obvious and essential differences. He defended his scriptural interpretations. And he just wrote with this real fire and energy that's uh, kind of amazing. And he wasn't afraid to change his mind. In these Unitarian tracts or pamphlets that were later published in a couple of books, he clearly is aware of the other type of Unitarian interpretation of John 1, but he eventually seems to settle on the Socinian type interpretation. So in 1692, he published a refutation of a book by a Luke Milborn entitled Mysteries in Religion Vindicated. And Nye's repost was called An Accurate Examination of the Principal Text Usually Alleged for the Divinity of Our Savior and for the Satisfaction by Him Made to the Justice of God for the Sins of Men, occasioned by a book of Mr. L. Milborn called Mysteries in Religion Vindicated. In this book, Nye argues for a Socinian-type understanding of John 1, 
And he ends up in this way, giving a loose paraphrase of the meaning of the passage. And he's got a point in doing this, which is that very often a Trinitarian just can't take this reading seriously. It's just too different. And all they can do is sort of roll their eyes and say, oh, it's just, it's just weird. It's goofy. It's tortured. It's twisted. It's bizarre. And, you know, in truth, it's Trinity theories, which are difficult to reconcile with the language in this passage. But Nye wants to show that, hey, on my interpretation, everything the author is saying here is understandable. And it sounds like the sort of thing an apostle might have said. So here's what he writes. It is a very common thing with our opposers to falsely assert that the Socinians cannot paraphrase this beginning of St. John's Gospel without making such a harsh sense as is next to ridiculous. Therefore, let us put all that has been said into one view in this following paraphrase. And do you, sir, and all men, judge whether it be harsh or uncouth. In the beginning of the Gospel era was the Messiah, whom the Jews used to call the Word, and we also may so call him, because he is the great messenger and preacher of the gospel word. This word was assumed into heaven and was there with God to be instructed in all that he was to say and do in the execution of the office of the Messiah. He was with the God, and he himself was a God, as he represented the person of God as his ambassador, and delivered his commands and word to men. On which account, very many, and in particular Moses, are called gods in Holy Scripture. The Messiah was decreed before the world was. The world was at first made with the intention to subject it, in the fullness of time, to the Messiah and his law, so that the world and all things may be said to have been made for him and that without respect or regard to him, nothing was made that was made. Yet as great a person as the Messiah is, this is always to be remembered, that he was flesh, or man, a man like us, who dwelled among us. I will say no more of him at this time but this, that John the Baptist, whom all men took to be a prophet, bore this testimony of him, that although the word came after him in respect of time, Yet the word was indeed before him in the excellence of his person, the dignity of his office, and the miraculous power over diseases and devils bestowed on him. Just a few comments on Nye's take. It's not clear to me why he thinks the Jews used to call the Messiah the word. I'm not aware of that, and he doesn't cite any evidence for this in the rest of this book, as far as I can tell. In the Old Testament, clearly the Word of God is not a person. Whatever the Word of God does, that's just what God does. He's not doing it through somebody else in their way of thinking. So why shouldn't you take the Word in that sense here, given the Jewish and Old Testament background of this passage? About his translation that the Word was a God, He's insisting on a point that was much insisted on by the great early Christian scholar Origen in the middle of the 3rd century, which is the difference between ha theos, the God in Greek, and theos, which often we would translate as a God. And he says, look, he says the word was with the God, but then he just says theos ain't halagos, which he wants to translate as the word was a God. So the grammar here is tricky. It is true that Origen, later on, mid-200s, makes a big deal out of the difference between theos without the article and ha theos with the article, with the the. And it is true that to put that the on there does clarify that you're talking about the God, the unique God. However, there are lots of instances, even in the Gospel according to John, where the word theos doesn't have the article and yet it most definitely refers to the Father. In his book, Jesus as God, the New Testament use of theos in reference to Jesus, scholar Dr. Murray J. Harris surveys the use of theos in this book. And he says when you have ha theos in the nominative case, it's always the subject, never the predicate. Uh, But he goes on to say several facts make it highly improbable that John intends any consistent distinction to be drawn between ha theos and theos, theos, 
and then he surveys the usage. Basically, theos occurs 83 times in John. 63 of those times it has the the on it, and 20 times it doesn't. But it's basically always the Father, except in the very small number of cases where it must be referring to somebody else. And actually, I would disagree with Murray Harris about some of those cases. So yeah, I think Stephen Nye is making too much of this little grammatical fine point here. In my view, the author leaves the the off of theos in the third clause when he says, theos ain't halagos, because if he were to say, ha theos ain't halagos, it might make you think that theos was the subject of the sentence. But theos is not the subject of the sentence. The subject is... As with the two previous assertions, it's still halagos, the word. So the term theos is functioning as the predicate. It's what's being said about the word. It's saying that the word was theos. So I don't think that grammatical point really settles the interpretation of the phrase theos ain't halagos. God was the word. The question is, what's the force of that? I don't think Nye adequately deals with that. He's very well aware about the issue with the verb ginomai, that it can just mean is or was or happened or maybe made. And he's also aware that you would think by the opening words, NRK, that there's a reference to the Genesis creation. And yet this interpretation says that the author is really just talking about the new creation era. So he kind of wants to cover both bases when it's talking about all things were made by this logos. He sums up his points by saying this, the short is either St. John speaks here of the old creation and the visible world, and then we ought to render his words, all things were made for him, the world was made for him, which is an allusion to a known saying of the Jews that the world was made for the Messiah namely, to subject it in the fullness of time to the Messiah and his law, a great and certain truth. Or, option two, he speaks of the new creation and the world which all men expected the Messiah should make. And if so, we understand him as saying, all things were made by him and the world was made by him. I think he's right. I think you can find that somewhere in Jewish tradition. I'm not sure if you can find it pre-Jesus exactly, because that's usually more difficult to find information from that era, but I think it's in rabbinic tradition somewhere. All things were made for him. I think that's grammatically possible. Although I think the by meaning is more likely. My last comment is I do like in general what Nye is trying to do. As he makes clear at the end of this chapter when he discusses transubstantiation, he's not a mystery monger. And he realizes that it's problematic to attribute an apparent contradiction to this author right in his first opening passage. So he's trying to come up with a reading that's self-consistent, which is well-motivated relative to the other things in the book and to other things we knew that were thought at the time. And I think he's even trying to come up with a reading that could have been understood by the original audience. I'm not sure he really shows that much, though. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what about 1 John 1? Does this help the Socinian case or hurt it? In this last segment, I want to express some concerns I have about the Socinian type interpretations of this famous passage. I don't think that any one of these objections by itself is enough to torpedo this reading. I think you have to consider all the facts together, and that's a difficult thing to do. In a sense, we're looking for the best explanation of what's been written. And this is a pretty decent explanation 
It seems to me like a better explanation than anything that Trinitarians have come up with, although that remains to be seen. I think we need to hear some Trinitarian interpretations. My concern about them is that they're always importing fourth century ideas, like the idea of a multi-personal God, or the idea that one is called God because one has a divine nature. They're importing these later ideas back into this chapter, and these are not things that John or his audience would have been presupposing. So just some general concerns. Everybody agrees that there's a kind of reference to Genesis in the opening words of this passage. Even the people who think that really the thrust of the passage is about the new creation. I think that given that we've started off with a reference to the Genesis creation, and then given that there is a background in the Old Testament of God creating things by his word, for instance, Psalm 33, 6, or just in Genesis, God says, and then things come to be, it's hard to get away from the impression that really it's the Genesis creation that's at issue. Another concern I have is that I'm not aware of any evidence that anyone took this sort of interpretation of the prologue before the time of Sosinus. And that's not a good sign. Now, that's not a killer objection because our evidence of non-Logos theory interpretations of John early on is just really, really poor. The sources by these mainstream Christians have been lost because the mainstream later on did not like them enough to continue to copy them. I am aware of some evidence of readers who thought that the Logos was not a being. They would compare it to a word or an utterance, which, you know, is what Logos can mean. And their point was that it's not a being, it's not a thing, it's not a person, it's not a self. I'm not aware of people who say, hey, the Logos is a man, just a man, and this is all about new creation. It has nothing to do with Genesis creation, really, even if there's a kind of oblique reference to it. It would make me friendlier to this interpretation if I did know that some of the dynamic monarchians thought that. Again, it's not a killer objection, but it is a consideration. Another general concern is that I still can't shake the impression that there's a time sequence in this passage, that it starts way back at the time of creation, talks about the word being the light of all people in ancient times, then it skips ahead to talk about John, then I think it moves from pre kind of special revelation times into revelation times, when God's word comes to his own, that is to the Jews, but the Jews are always rejecting God's word. But of course, not all of the Jews rejected God's word. Some of them obeyed it in faith, and so were children of God. And then it moves on to a later time, and, Kai, and then the word became flesh and lived among us. So it seems to me it, it's moving through time, and the Socinian reading just denies that. It says, no, this is all about, you know, the time roughly of Jesus' ministry, and specifically the beginning of it. One last concern I have is that, as far as I can tell, just about everyone who holds this Socinian interpretation of this passage thinks that the beginning of 1 John helps their cause. And specifically, just the first four verses. There's a kind of prologue to this letter. And that's really curious and interesting, isn't it? It's plausible to think that the letter is by the same author as the book, and that the letter comes after the book and that the letter is correcting misinterpretations of the prologue. We do know that, at least well into the 100s, Gnostics were running crazy with the language of the prologue, claiming that light and life and the logos are all different eons, and, you know, just kind of going to town interpreting this as about the inhabitants of the heavenly realm, or about the pleroma, the fullness of the divine realm. So let's start off by hearing how the 1817 New Testament in an improved version renders 1 John 1-4. through Concerning the word of life, him who was from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen with our eyes, whom we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. For the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that everlasting life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, him whom we have seen and heard, we declare to you.
that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be completed. Now, if you look at the notes, there's something funny going on here. They have used a version by a beloved friend of theirs. This was the Unitarian minister, Theophilus Lindsay, who is an older friend and I think kind of a mentor of the main editor of this New Testament in an improved version, Thomas Belsham. It's Belsham who wrote a loving biography of Lindsay. And in one of Lindsay's works, he had proposed this as a rendering of the first four verses. Interestingly, Lindsay is not a proponent of the Socinian reading of John 1. However, he does think that this passage is about the man Jesus. And so you can see what he does there. He lards the whole passage with as many personal pronouns as he can fit. The word of life, him who is from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen, whom we have looked upon, him whom we have seen and heard, and so on. But, you know, again, to their credit, these are honest scholars, and they know that putting a bunch of personal pronouns here is controversial and is certainly not required by the Greek. They used as their starting text for this edition of the New Testament a version by Archbishop Newcomb. So in a footnote, they specify that Newcomb had translated as that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked on, and our hands have handled, as concerning the word of life. And then for verse 2, they say, that which, rather than him whom. They say that's what's in the Greek and that's what Newcomb translates. Okay, but if it's in the Greek, that which, why didn't we translate that which? Well, it's because they want this to all be totally about the man Jesus. And they feel a little bit guilty about pushing this, as evidenced by their giving another translation by a scholar named Wakefield. I don't know anything about him, whether he's Trinitarian or Unitarian, but they give his translation of uh, most of this in another footnote. He translates, What was it first? What we heard, what we saw with our eyes, what we observed, and our hands handled, concerning the doctrine of life, for the life showed itself, and we saw it, and bear testimony, and declare unto you this eternal life, which was with the Father, and showed itself to us. What we saw and heard, we declare to you. So instead of whom, him, etc., it's what, 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 which, we saw it, and so on. And that's what's actually happening in the Greek. In the first verse, the author is repeatedly using neuter pronouns, so neither masculine nor feminine, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And then in the second verse, instead of proceeding to talk about the word of life, which he just mentioned, if he was going to talk about the word, he would then use masculine pronouns because logos is a masculine noun in Greek. Instead of that, he switches to talking about the life instead, which is a feminine noun in Greek. So, this life, feminine, was revealed and we have seen it, feminine it, literally her, and testify to her, but again, the sense seems to be it, and declare to you the eternal life, feminine, that was with the Father and was revealed to us. Now in the third verse, he goes back to neuter again. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, I mean, it looks like even though he's going to mention Jesus in the passage, he's going out of his way to use the neuter and the feminine and not to talk about the logos of life as if it were a he. In fact, there is no logos, which is theos, which is exactly mentioned here, right? It was this message of life, which was from the beginning. He's writing to them about what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. And he doesn't say, oh, and by the way, well, I'm talking about the word here, the logos of John 1, which is to say the Messiah. No, he says, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It's not the word of life, which they are strictly seeing and touching, 
but they have had sensory evidence relating to the word of life. In other words, they interacted with the man Jesus, and through their interactions with the man Jesus, they encountered this message of life. Verse 2, going over here to the New Revised Standard, This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. That was with the Father. Hmm, that sounds familiar. The Logos was in the beginning, and the Logos was with God. That is to say, with the Father. Okay, well now we've clarified that it's a message of life. It's not a person, but this word and the life that's in it, these are with the Father and have now been revealed to us. Verse 3, we declare to you what we have seen and heard, right? Life of Jesus so that you may also have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So if you accept the hypothesis that this is by the same author as John 1, that it's later than John 1, and even that it's trying to correct misinterpretations of John 1, it looks like the message of life is what was in the beginning, and they're preaching to you, the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. It seems to me right now, and I could be persuaded otherwise, that this actually doesn't help the Socinian interpretation at all. If anything, it favors the other interpretation that Unitarian scholars have taken, which is that the Logos is something like God's eternal wisdom or message or purpose which, you know, was eternally with God and through which God created and then which came to be in the man Jesus, was, so to speak, made flesh. Again, it's not a killer point. You could do what Lindsay does and you could say, actually, yes, John 1 is about, you know, basically God's eternal wisdom through which God made all things, then being most fully revealed and expressed in this man. Uh, But here, now the beginning here that we're talking about is the beginning of the gospel era. And so he's calling Jesus here the word of life. And we've seen this and testified to it and declare this eternal life that was with the Father, I guess, you know, at the beginning of his ministry and was revealed to us. So you could split the difference. You could say John 1 is about the Logos, not directly, principally about Jesus. And you could say that 1 John 1 through 4 really is all about Jesus. But, I mean, there are just so many words in common here and ideas in common and even kind of a similar flow of those ideas that I do find it plausible that here the author is very briefly giving a correctional commentary on the start of his famous gospel, because I think that from a very early time, probably crazy Gnostic types ran wild with it. And however one reads it, even if you're not a crazy Gnostic type, there are things there that could make you think that the Logos is supposed to be the same self as the man Jesus. But then he would here be saying, we're witnessing to the word of life. It's the eternal life. It's this word of life and the eternal life that was with the Father. And, of course, we have experienced this in the man Jesus. So those are my thoughts for now. Again, I'm not in a hurry to make up my mind about this. I want to hear more from Trinitarian interpreters, and I want to hear more from these Unitarians who don't think that the RK in John 1 is the beginning of Jesus' ministry or something. But they are saying, actually, in a way, John 1 is starting off by commenting on the Genesis creation and then working his way forward from there in time. This week's thinking music has been the track Monkey Bars by Andy G. Cohen. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download that entire track. Thanks again to our friend Brandon for lending his voice to these interesting earlier Unitarian sources. Hey, have you heard that the Unitarian Christian Alliance now has a YouTube channel? And this channel has some really neat, shareable, short videos. And you may recognize Brandon's voice on some of those. On the blog post for this episode at trinities.org, I'll put a link to these videos and to the UCA YouTube channel so that you can subscribe. As a matter of fact... I'll give you an audio preview of one of these videos entitled, Who Was the First Trinitarian? 
And you'll have to check out the link on the blog post to see the excellent animations that go with this audio. Who was the first Trinitarian? Christian tradition claims that God is triune, three persons in one being. In fact, most Christians today say they are Trinitarians when asked. But who was the first Trinitarian? Most Christian theologians will claim that the idea that God is three persons in one being is a revelation contained within the New Testament, and that the Old Testament figures like Abraham, Moses, and David didn't think of God as a trinity. So then, who did? The words three persons in one being didn't come off of the lips of Jesus or his apostles. In fact, Jesus said that God was my father and your father, my God and your God. And he affirmed the creed from Deuteronomy 6.4 that reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So if not Jesus, then perhaps one of his apostles, like Paul, was the first to claim to be a Trinitarian. Not Paul. He says the one God is the Father. In his letters he writes, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we live, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. And for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hmm. So if the first Trinitarian isn't in the Bible, who was it? It's argued among scholars, but likely the first persons to be traditional Trinitarians were theologians like Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzus, who participated in the rough-and-tumble church politics of the late 4th century. That's three centuries after Jesus. So that leaves Bible-believing Christians with a choice to make. Should we be Trinitarians? If Old Testament heroes like Abraham, Moses, and David weren't, our Lord and Savior Jesus wasn't, his apostles weren't, and the first Trinitarian appears over 300 years after them? If you say no, ally with us. Bring your Bible and leave behind the confusion. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.